Hello. Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name's Alastair Roth. I'm Executive Director of AAA Victoria. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet, wherever we may be, and pay respects to elders past and present. So a very warm welcome to AIA members and guests, both here in Dyson House and our online Zoom audience. And for the Zoom audience, we'll take questions at the end. Please use the Q&A tab to put any questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge um, three people, the trustees of the Walter Mangold Trust Fund, who have a long connection themselves with Timor Lest, uh, fund scholarships to bring students here to, to learn English, but also great supporters of the Institute and generously subsidize our young people to come to events like this free of charge. So thank you very much for the support. So to discuss the highs and lows of Australia's relationship with Timor Lest, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Helen Hill. Now, Helen has a long involvement with the country. She first visited Portuguese Timor as a Monash University's master's student in politics back in 1975. She then went on as part of a group of Australian postgrads assisting Jose Ramos Horta set up the Office of the Democratic Republic of TMLS at the UN in New York. She worked for the Australian Aid Programme. She taught at Victoria University in Melbourne for 21 years, introducing a bachelor's degree in Asia Pacific Community Development. She's involved in, in, involved in founding the Timor Lest Studies Association with Professor Michael Leach of Swinburne. And since retiring from VU in 2012, she's largely lived in Timor Lest, doing short term consultancies for Ministry of Education, Human Capital Development Fund, and the UNDP. So, Helen, it's great that we're able to get you on a flying visit to Melbourne. Thank you very much. And the podium is yours. Thank you, Alastair. Um, it's a great honour and privilege to be invited to speak at the Institute. Before I go any further, I will pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land of which we are meeting today. I'm very pleased since coming back to Australia after so many years to see it is such a common thing now for people to recognise and remember the traditional owners, even Qantas invite, welcomes you to Larrakia country in Darwin. So um, we are moving in many ways in Australian politics. And what I'm going to be talking to you today about is how are we moving in Australia's relationships with Timor-Leste, a small country one hour's flying time from Darwin, which most of us, I must admit, even when I was a student, I had almost never heard of. I remember reading an article in National U, the National Students' Newspaper, about how there was a cheap way to get out of Australia. It was only $30, and that was via Bacow, Darwin Bacow. TAA flight was $30, cheapest way to get out of Australia, should you need to. But nobody knew what was there, what a Portuguese colony was, good heavens. Um, so we have moved a long way in the time since I've been a student and I've been um, involved in, in thinking and uh, my sort of life history, which Alistair just gave you a little bit of some of, a slice of, uh, has sort of propelled me into various areas that I never would have been thinking about had it not been for the existence of Timor. So, uh, and on the, on the cover there, I've put, on the first slide, I've put a photograph, a recent photograph. You'll see it's from The Guardian. I couldn't get rid of The Guardian sign, but um, of Jose Ramashorta last week without Anthony Albanese in the National Press Club, uh, we have a lot of history. Australia has a lot of history with Timor and it is continuously changing. And I guess the basic theme of my talk is going to be that Australians have, over the last few decades, been 
speaking about Timor with many different voices, probably largely only two different voices, those that represented the voice that it's better for a small country like Timor to be part of a large country, and those who understood the concept of self-determination and the right to independence and who struggled for it. And Australians in both of those categories in some ways, I think maybe coming closer together, <laughs> let's hope. So my talk is a number of episodes in Australia's relations with Timor that show how and where different people stood and, and expectations that were set up. Now, this first one, oh yes. The first one, of course, I click that, do I? has got to be the Second World War. And I'm sorry I didn't have more time to say anything about this, but many of you will know about it. Uh, Australia sent troops into Portuguese Timor, which was neutral, before the Japanese had indicated they were going to go there. Big debate about uh, whether they should have gone in or not. But the fact of the matter is that the Australians that went into Timor in the Second World War made very close relationships with Timorese people, many of whom lasted the rest of their lives. And at the end of the war, the, Timor the Australians dropped leaflets on Timor saying, your friends will never forget you. And that set up all sorts of expectations among Timorese that Australia would remember them. And that is really the background to everything else that happened. Now, as you know, in, um, on Anzac Day 1974, the Portuguese had a revolution and a democratic uh, regime emerged which wanted to give independence to all the colonies. What was Australia's response? And I've put some actual statements here uh, because... Uh, then often not widely recognised that, that Alan Renouf, head of the Department of Foreign Affairs, actually recommended Australia support self-determination for Timor and, and was supported by the Foreign Affairs Minister of the Day. And yet the Foreign Affairs Department made a strong recommendation that Timor would not be a viable state and, of course, the next time, I'll go straight on to this one. The next time Australia mentioned Timor was with two famous meetings between the leaders, between Gough Whitlam and Suharto, uh, with the famous statement, an independent East Timor would be an unviable state and a potential threat to the stability of the region. But they added the people of Timor should have their say about their future. And I wrote an article way back at the time, a conference paper on the contradiction within this statement. You know, here you are saying, oh, better to be part of Indonesia, but people should say what they want, have, have their say. And the people not realising that, of course, if the people had their say, they would vote for independence. So that contradictions were set up. Now, I'll just mention this this time Jose Ramos Hortas. Oh, hang on. No, I've, oh. Oh, I've lost my place. Oh, gee whiz. No, I'm going the wrong way, am I? Oh. Oh, now everybody's seen all the slides. Oh, no. Oh. oh. Can we start at the beginning? <laughs> um, right. Here we are. No, that's the last one. That's the last one. <laughs> These are meant to be gone through quickly. Ah, yes, Ramos Horta's first Australian tour. Because after hearing, oh, that's right. Yes, that's the setup I wanted. Yes. After hearing the statement from uh, Whitlam and Suharto, the educated people in Timor who could hear it on Radio Australia were absolutely shocked. Why are these 
these two neighbouring countries discussing our future when we haven't even been asked? Uh, and this led to Ramos Horta making his first tour to Australia. Uh, Jose Ramos Horta was a um, well-educated secondary school graduate. Don't forget the leaders of the movement were all secondary school graduates. There was almost no university. There was no university in Timor. He had been exiled to Mozambique. He'd been punished by the Portuguese. He had been a founding member of the unofficial pro-independence group that used to meet before any pro-independence party was formed. And he had been to Darwin before, where he and so was a reasonably good English speaker. So he came down to Sydney and Melbourne and started effectively uh, a solidarity movement very early in the piece. I think I'm going to have to move over here so I can. Uh, ah, yes, and and this is the one we've already seen. I'm not sure where that picture is, whether it's in Monosobo or, or Townsville, but uh, they did have a very amicable relationship, Whitlam and Sahato. Um, and then in 1975, February 1975, I was actually in Timor doing my research and I had to go round a roundabout way because of Cyclone Tracy. I couldn't get that cheap flight from Darwin to Baokau. I had to do a go a roundabout way. And I was in Dili when I saw a, information about these, these headlines on the Age newspaper, probably other newspapers as well, which led to two delegations arriving in Dili while I was still there. A delegation of uh, civil society members, which included Oh, oh, no, this is the next, yes. Yes, the, which included Jill Jolliffe and, and another delegation, members of parliament, the Caucus Foreign Affairs and Defence Policy Committee. Now, and Ramos Horta later in July went to visit Canberra. That was a year after his first visit and was not allowed to meet any ministers. The government had decided no minister will meet with Jose Ramos Horta, but in fact, Horta had plenty of friends in the parliament. Uh, and of course, there was a person working in the parliament, James Dunn, who had been the consul in Timor and who provided invaluable research to the whole movement and to the struggle. Um, he was one of the people who was very, was, was honoured, but well, even what before his death, he was re re regarded as providing a lot of the valuable information, uh, but the Australian government had great difficulty in dealing with that information and with the members of parliament like Ken Fry, uh, um, Gordon McIntosh, Tom Uren, and his staffer, Anthony Albanese. <laughs> so, um, so it was, this was... A, a blockage so so talking about a high, highs and lows i'd say this is one of the lows of timor's relations with 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 australia's relations with timor but if you're on the other side of the debate you might think it's a high you know different people have different views and when i went to live in canberra i discovered i better not say too much about the anu but i i discovered that no one wanted to talk about Timor. They all thought it would be Indonesian forever. So I went and did my research on the Pacific. Uh, but anyway, getting back to 75, the, um, of course, the, a big low in the whole relationship was the death of the five TV newsmen. And worse, even worse than the death, although that's very bad, a cover-up by the two governments. And we had hoped to have Hamish McDonald on the Zoom tonight, but he's unfortunately not able to make it, I think. But he wrote, he and, and Des Ball wrote a very enlightening book, Death in, in Balibo Lies in Canberra, 
And and I think that, and, and other books have been written since then. Jill Jolliffe wrote one called Cover Up. Shirley Shackleton wrote one called Circle of Silence, which is about to be made into a film. Uh, and the, 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 the lives of the Balibo Five are remembered, but I'm not sure that all the lessons have been learnt about government cover-ups. But anyway, we can talk about that later. Uh, groups were set up around Australia. And I'm regarding these as all highs in this in the relationship because for the Timorese who, even before they the Indonesian occupation, made friends in Australia uh, in a way which is almost unique for any country. I can't think of another country. The only country I can think of that had, well, two countries that had sort of solidarity movements in other countries one was Vietnam, of course, there was the Vietnam War movement. And the other one was South Africa, where there was the anti-apartheid movement. But, uh, but Timor is almost unique. And certainly Australia didn't pay the same attention or develop the same sort of relationships with its own colony, Papua New Guinea, which could have helped it a lot after independence, I think. Um, I'll make a mention of a person who, who also uh, contributed a great deal, uh, Pat Walsh, and he's unfortunately unable to be with us tonight because he's got another meeting uh, on another issue of the Aboriginal reconciliation and its similarities with Timor, so that um, Pat is somebody who always saw opportunities for Australian institutions to be doing things better and pushed that. Uh, David Scott was another one. Uh, his arrival back from Timor on what turned out to be the day of the, end of the occupation uh, led to the formation of the Australia East Timor Association, of which, which is still going and of which we have a few committee members here tonight with us, uh, including longstanding chair, Jean McLean. And we've got, and it, it and, and David was able to also uh, work very closely with Ramos Horta in New York and help develop the, some of the strategies, but also uh, how Australians could be doing it better. The diplomatic front, what we, the, the, the Timorese claimed their, their success was due to the operation and interaction of three fronts of the struggle. One was the armed struggle, the armed wing, Fallon Teal. Uh, another one was the diplomatic front set up by Ramos Horta, uh, which dates its, its origins to his first speech at the United Nations immediately after the, uh, the, the immediately after the in full-scale invasion. Uh, and interestingly, is the Australian, no, sorry, I'll go back to the third sector, the, the third wing of the, of the struggle is the clandestine front. People inside, people inside Timor and including students who went to study inside T Indonesia, who, who became, who operated more or less to make the occupation unworkable in the long, in the long run through peaceful means, not through, uh, although some of them did later join the armed struggle, particularly after the uh, Santa Cruz massacre. But um, the, the, the Australians, the, the work done in, in the diplomatic front in New York was interesting because the UN has a lot of opportunities where opinions can be given. The, the decolonization committee holds hearings Petitioners can speak, and Ramos Horta and uh, David Scott and, and Susie Roth would organise people to come and speak. Well-known supporters of Timor, like Jim Dunn, and uh, and people from other countries, including they they got the Tongan bishop to come and speak about his country being so much smaller than Timor, and it's a viable country. <laughs> so there's a lot of, of angles were put. And to my great shock, when I was over there, there was going to be, they were preparing for another hearing at which one of the speakers was going to be Gough Whitlam, 
ex-Prime Minister of Australia and Peter Hastings went to New York to denounce the bishop. Hang on, we'll, we'll get on to that later when I talk about the bishop. So, oh, yes, here we're talking, I've got the slide about the, the, the Australians who supported the diplomatic front in New York. But, of course, many Australians supported it here in Australia, Pat Walsh and John Waddingham and uh, many others. Uh, and opportunities came when, for example, Sydney Morning Herald. Now, I think this might have been earlier than, than 82. I've got 82 in my chronology in my book, but I think it may be earlier. But, um, but this is when the, the apostolic administrator, Don Martino de Costa Lopez, uh, sent a letter to the Sydney Morning Herald talking about the appalling famine and the number of people that were dying. And there were photographs from Peter Rogers, who'd been working in the Indonesian embassy, in, in Australian embassy, sorry, in Jakarta. Uh, and this led to this huge row between Whitlam, who'd been taken to Timor to be shown there was no famine, by the CSIS, the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, that really were the people behind the occupation, and the, the bishop who was claiming that, that all sorts of people were dying. And here's another bit of information about the bishop. Uh, he was he was technically not a bishop. He was an apostolic administrator, but appointed by the Vatican to to rule the church in Timor because the Vatican did not want to amalgamate the Timorese church in the Indonesian church. They resisted that. And so they were in sense an ally of Timorese nationalism. And this fellow, Don Martino, who'd actually been quite a right-wing conservative member of the parliament in the, under the Portuguese, he could not meet the Australian bishops, except for one of them, because he had been warned by most of, he had been warned by B.A. Santa Maria. They had been warned by B.A. Santa Maria that he was a dangerous communist. He was too close to Fretland. And, and he went away very disappointed and very sad. He went on a went then to the Pacific and got involved with the Nuclear Free Pacific Movement, which also supported Timor. Uh, and he was, uh, but went back to Portugal and sadly died not long after. So that book is a very interesting one about his life, though, uh, which is available from the Australia East Timor Association. I see they've still got piles of copies. So um, now another event of interest was, and again, another another project of Pat Walsh was to get three women registered to go to the Nairobi Women's Conference and meet feminists from around the world. Now, I happened to be living in Canberra then, and I happened to be organising another study tour of Canberra Public Servants, actually, to the Nairobi Women's Conference. So we were able to meet up with the Timorese group we discovered also a West Papuan group. And Amelia Perez and Inez Almeida, who's now the ambassador in Canberra, they gave some very powerful speeches to people who had never heard of Timor before. Never heard of Timor before, but they knew of other struggles. And so putting it in within the context of liberation struggles, they were able to bring new countries into supporting Timor at the UN. Now, then, of course, we had the um, we had the announcement by Bob Hawke that Australia gives de jure recognition, having given de facto recognition that Timor, they didn't call it Timor Lesh, they called it the 27th province of Indonesia. Uh, is part of Indonesia and its inhabitants are Indonesians. And I know that many people who, who came to migrate to Australia from Timor after this 
were very shocked to see that that when they, even before they got Australian citizenship or even after that, they said that their passport said they were Indonesians and they were not Indonesians, they were Timorese. But it, it was the whole, uh, the whole legal thing. Of, of course, ambassador, Portugal withdrew its ambassador. Uh, and this really was a beginning of setting up quite a conflict with Portugal, which I think was in a sense quite unnecessary. Now, here's a, here's a, a, a plus, here's a, a, a high that happened uh, right in the middle of the, or right at the end of the quiet 80s. The quiet 80s were when almost nothing seemed to be happening diplomatically to move the situation along. Uh, and yet, you know, there were people like John Sinnott keeping the Australia East Timor Association going, selling books, getting out information, uh, lobbying. And the diplomacy training program at University of New South Wales is quite an extraordinary institution because it's still going today. It's still doing the same thing, really. Ramos Horta was its first um, sponsor. He more or less encouraged them to set it up. It was training young Timorese in how to use the UN systems and do lobbying and, and uh, advocacy work. And when Timor got its independence, they all they then started doing this for everybody else. They hold the sessions now in Dili every year. Uh, and then they, but of course, the Australian government wouldn't touch this because it was run by Ramos Horta. But interestingly, the minute the referendum was over, I was in Dili one time in 2000, August 2000, and I saw Jim Dunn there and I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm working for the diplomacy training program. I'm funded by the Australian government. <laughs> so, so in a sense, here's an example of the civil society action finally coming together with a government action when the government realises it would be better to do this than not have people trained in use of UN systems, et cetera. And I think this is what we've seen throughout the history of the time. And I'm trying to give examples of where people with one view have sort of moved a bit towards the other view. Um, and here we had, this was an, again, an astounding uh, event within, during the struggle we had uh, Robert Dom, a lawyer, going on a long, arduous, difficult and dangerous journey through Indonesia, through Timor, well, through Indonesia, into Timor, and meeting up with Shanana Gushmau in his hideout and interviewing him at great length. It uh, produced a whole book, it's his, his, inter his interview. It was also broadcast for an hour on the ABC. It was also... Um, and one of the interesting points to be made in it, why it's of relevance to us today still, is his statement that Australia has been an accomplice in the genocide perpetrated by the occupation forces because the interests which Australia wants to secure with the annexation of East Timor to Indonesia are evident. The best proof is the Timor Gap Agreement. In fact, I should have put the next one first. I think this is the one I should have had just before that, because this is, of course, the famous event, which we all remember from the photograph, uh, where the Timor Gap was divided up. The gap that was left because the Portuguese wouldn't recognise any borders was divided up with Indonesia and Australia agreeing to share equally the revenues, the royalties and revenues from anything, any oil found in that area. Now, Gareth Evans at the time, I'm sure, believed it was a genuinely progressive thing because, and in a sense, the idea of sharing royalties and revenues with the neighbouring country is not a bad idea. The only thing was, in this particular case, 
the Indonesians don't have any rights to that land, to that, to that seabed by international law. And you would have expected Gareth as a lawyer to be a little bit more aware of that. But nevertheless, uh, that is really what prompted the statement by Shanana that I just read out before. And in a sense, has underlain a lot of how the Timorese view Australia ever since sorry to say. Now, um, I personally don't believe that oil and gas under the sea should be a determining feature of the relations between Australia and Timor, but we are sort of stuck with it. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about it later when we get on to the, uh, the maritime boundary issue. But uh, Gareth, I think now doesn't, you know, has changed his mind quite a bit. So we've heard. And then again, 10 years after the Nairobi conference, we had the Beijing Women's Conference. And again, Timorese organised themselves this time to go to the conference and, and met up with people from other non-self-governing territories in New Caledonia and got something into the actual women's, uh, the statement of the Beijing Women's Conference on women in colonies you know which which uh, th that was quite an achievement because uh you know some of the same women were there before but others and Sal British was on the committee of the nuclear free and independent pacific movement who helped this all happen uh so I think there is a lot of kudos that Australian civil society can take from some of the events that happened uh then next is no hang on 98 hang on I think we're going along too fast on some of these I think uh oh no oh oh I've gone too far which now how can I get bottom oh oh I see Ah, yes. Now, this is the one. This is Laurie Brereton. Yes. Now, this was the ALP conference. Yes. Uh, and, in fact, I was just speaking the other day about this with Jean McLean, and uh, who I think was the author of the resolution that, <laughs> that uh, Laurie Brereton passed. And, again, that Laurie Brereton asked to take over moving. And which goes to show about how change can take place because within the Labor Party for many years, Jean and, and a few others and me for a while too, have always been trying to get up good resolutions in the Labor Party on Timor. And we normally succeeded at the, at the state level, you know, support for self-determination of Timor. Only problem is Australian states don't have foreign policy, so they can't implement it. But uh, when Jean tried to move a resolution at the ALP conference, 1998, uh, who should come along but Laurie Brereton? I don't know if you want to say anything about it now. Yeah. Uh, they were all in, in, in a file, so you'd look at which ones you wanted to move. And I oh. always had the East Timor motion, and it always yeah. got defeated. And Laurie yes. came up at the last one. And Laurie Brereton came up to me and said, oh, Jean, would you mind if I moved your East Timor motion? I said, please do so. <laughs> because I knew if he was moving it, it would get up, yeah. and that's how that that occurred. People would vote for it, yes. And it, so everybody voted for it. The yeah. yeah, and he was the most unlikely advocate for Timor too, being from the New South Wales right, and not having been well. I don't know whether he'd been associated with Timor solidarity groups, but he he obviously thought through it and realised this is time for a change of policy. That policy change by the Labor Party 
a, a commentator say was even influential on John Howard, who was in government at the time. Now, uh, hang on, which, yes, but John Howard got tripped up <laughs> by something else. Um, uh, and many of you will have heard of this. John Howard decided to send a letter to President Habibi, you know, who had taken over from Suharto. And this created a window of opportunity that Habibi might be more open-minded than Suharto. So John Howard said to him, why don't you do what they're doing in New Caledonia, what the French are doing in New Caledonia, you know, giving people 20 years, a delayed referendum, basically. And um, this, is, this is highly technical and difficult to understand. Uh, Nick McClellan's almost the only person who understands it, but in Australia, but the... The upshot of this was Habibi was so incensed by being compared with the French. We are not colonialists. Because, of course, in the New Caledonia case, the Indonesians support the Kanaks and the Kanaks and their right to independence. <laughs> so when Howard said, you know, listen, you could learn something from the French, this was outrageous. So... Brandishing the letter from John Howard, he proposes to his cabinet an early referendum on autonomy or independence. And, um, and yes, offended by being compared. And the only person in his cabinet to oppose it was Ali Alatas. So therefore it got through and we were on the way to the May 5th agreement. Uh, so that in a sense, you could call this a high of Timorese relations with Australian relations with Timor that John Howard sort of by mistake prompted the referendum, which again is a sort of bringing together of almost the two sides of the debate, even though he may not have wanted to do that at the time. Uh, this is what the, the Indonesia, of course, also didn't want to pay for the Timorese for 10 years before giving them a vote. So or 20 years or however long it was. So, um, so then we began to see, we begin to see the Australian government funding some activities proposed by the Solidarity Movement and the Resistance and universities. I, I should mention, and I'll do later mention, the role of universities in this because a number of universities who had Timorese diaspora students, particularly, and Victoria University had a lot because we are a dual sector university. We, yes. Um, uh, and they came in to do their English and then they stayed on to do a TAFE course. Then some of them articulated into a, a bachelor's and even some to a master's. And one did a PhD in Portugal, I think, afterwards. But um, so uh, so this was, this was a, uh, this conference, um, it was Alexander Downer uh, contributed quite a, bo a, a body of money. He gave the money to Victoria University. He didn't give it to the, you know, Etta or the, the Solidarity Movements, but Timorese were identified to bring from around the world who had capacity and, and involvement in different political, different economic issues that would be important after independence. And I think that was a great thing to do. And in a sense, it's, it's sort of set up the use way of doing things in continuing to have conferences on policy issues. It was partly begun by that. We don't get any government money um, anymore, unfortunately. But, um, oh, hang on, I, pr I pressed the wrong one, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get back to, I'm trying to get on to Bill Clinton. Yes. Now, um, we've, we've, I've sort of left, left out a bit of history here, which you all know the referendum was on the 30th of August, 1999. The vote that the result was announced on the 
5th, was it? 8th of September. No, it was, it was 6th of September. And militia violence was unleashed. Now, a scheduled meeting of APEC was taking place in Wellington. APEC's one of these organisations that always, I think, looking for a purpose. It suddenly had a very important task to do with Bill Clinton there, uh, Indonesia, uh, John Howard, uh, and uh, sufficient, and, and Jose Ramosh Horta went in and had some time with Bill Clinton, was able to lobby him. Uh, Clinton realised the seriousness of the situation, was able to put pressure on, on Habibi, and John Howard was there, who offered to lead a coalition of the willing, a peacekeeping force to restore law and order. So it's very fortuitous that that APEC meeting was happening. And also the players all sort of played their part in a way. And again, we had a coming together of the different sides to reach a conclusion caused by the militia violence. Now, and the Interfet uh, landed in landed in Timor on 20th of September, possibly the swiftest response in UN peacekeeping history. And on, on, uh, Interfet, Interfet was a very uh, significant organisation. I'll just say a word about its name first because it was going to be called IFET. And then they discovered there is already another IFET. The IFET was the International Federation for East Timor, made up of different solidarity groups, including ETAN from New York, uh, Tarpol from London with Carmel Budiacho and, and Charlie Shiner and, and um, John, oh, uh, Oh, for the other fellow, fell, the other fellow in 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 New York, and to that was added AETA, Australia East Timor Association. John Sinnott, in the early days of the internet, this is the internet had an impact on how the struggle was able to be uh, played out, was able to be conducted, and it was part of, largely Carmel Budiacho's idea to get together around the world in a, a big, uh, and I think it was then uh, ETAN that implemented with Reg East Timor, Reg East Timor being a daily email list with information supplied by those different groups in the different countries, which has morphed into what is still going, which is the ETAN daily emails. Now, so they couldn't use the word IFET, so they called it Interfet. Uh, but another spin-off of Interfet uh, that I, I like to mention is some of the participants in Interfet maintained their interest in Timor and have dedicated themselves, now I'm, I'm, I might be going, to continue work. And I think some of them might be on our, on our Zoom list particularly the, the soy, Friends of Soy Barda and also Wild Timor Coffee. So people from Interfet, a lot of them have continued. But I'd better move fast through this because we want to have some discussion. Um, now, in fact, I think uh, these are just things that happened in that, that could be called highs and lows in Australian uh, Timor, uh, Shanana, and also Abel Guterres. People will know Abel Guterres uh, from long time bus driver in Melbourne, actually Timorese, who became active in the in the in the uh, solidarity movement, and then was appointed as the first staffer and later consul in the embassy that the, this office then became the embassy of Timor Lest in Melbourne and getting back to some practical things one of the earliest groups to get going was the Royal Australian College of Surgeons I won't probably say a lot about this but when it comes to something that both the surgeons initiated but the government then supported 
it has been outstanding. Um, another good thing the government did was to host the first donors meet, one of the, the fifth donors meeting in 2001, which brought together people from both government and the civil society, solidarity movements, diaspora team raised. Um, here's the bit about universities. Um, here's an example of, this is actually a photograph of Ego Lemos getting his master's, uh, which he got with the benefit of a scholarship from the Irish. All sorts of solutions were being set, set up, you know, places being offered, fee waivers, different things. And suddenly out of the blue, the Irish said they'd like to fund Ego. So we didn't have to fundraise for him, which was good. Um, and the students got themselves organised. And uh, any of you will know Alex and Nivio. I better just move quickly through these. We continued having conferences. And again, this, this conference was not supported by the government, but we managed to get some support from some of the um, companies that make money out of the aid program, you know, the ones that contracting, managing contractors. Uh, so that was quite a successful conference. And at the same time, we had an academic seminar uh, with Michael Leach, who's sitting in the back row here, and that's a photograph of him <laughs> launching a book at the first Timor Lesh Studies Association conference. So here we have, a, you know, academics, universities coming together in a way that can put forward some analysis of what's been happening. But meanwhile, talking of uh, CMAT's treaty was being signed. We didn't know, of course, that spying was going on. Uh, and here are the, this is like the equivalent of, of Gareth Evans and Ali Alatas. I thought they had some champagne there, but um, trying to, you know, Al Alexander Downer trying to celebrate this great thing as if this is a great achievement. Uh, but as we now know, it's, it's, it didn't. It, it, uh, and that's a long history and complex history. Um, stu students, schools and universities started bringing people to Timor. Um, and we did eventually, and I didn't get, get around to mentioning things like uh, the, the, the World Court, you know, Timor taking... Australia to the World Court was also a significant event, which in but in a sense unlocked the possibility to move towards the maritime boundary uh, agreement. And there we have um, what's the name? Julie Bishop and Agio Pereira signing it. And they are the people that were around. Now we are looking at this is all the slides I've got, but, um, oh, hang on. No, I've gone the wrong way again. I've gone the wrong way. But in the future, we have another generation of people. And very interestingly, I mean, this is a bit amusing, but the, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Timor-Leste is Adelgisa Magno. And as you see in both these photographs, she's met up with new ministers from the Albanese government, one is in Lisbon, one is in Cambodia, and it's, a, it's astounding the way that they seem to be colour coordinated. And we well, just wonder, is this a sign that Timor and Australia are going to become more coordinated together and be on the same page again? So let's hope so, and let's hear some comments and questions from people here. Uh, thank you very much for that. Excellent. Thanks, Helen. That was great, and it's always good to get your um, your perspective on these because you've been involved for so long, and 
it really is. It's I always learn something. Yeah, I always learn something new, and I did today. And uh, I'm just wondering, projecting from that, uh, you, the big issue right now, of course, is the um, oil and gas, Tasimane. And obviously, the president's just been here, Jose Ramos Orta, and that was the key theme of his visit. And uh, from your long perspective and relationships, um, that's obviously the key issue right now between Australia and Timor Leste because the maritime boundary itself has been resolved. What's your view on what's likely to happen there, or what's your view on what's at stake there that people aren't talking about? Um, those are my questions. Uh, oh, this is a microphone. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Now, Michael, it's good for you to bring us back to reality with this because, uh, in a sense, I was wanting to focus a little bit more on things other than this. But of course, it is the underlying issue. And this, I'll just make a couple of points because there are two things tied up in this, or at least two things tied up in this. And that is one is whether investment in oil and gas is a good development strategy for Timor. And the other one is the role of China. And I think there are ways in which Australians may exaggerate both of those a bit, because when we were working in with Ramos Horta in his office in 1976 in New York, we had some lovely IBM Selectric typewriters. I don't know if how many people remember those. They were donated by the Chinese. The Chinese were the first to give practical assistance to the diplomatic front because they wanted to see it succeed. Uh, and the relationship between particularly Ramos Horta, but actually all foreign ministers since has been with China, has been very straightforward and down the line, unlike the Pacific Island countries that waver and move around and, you know, switch from Taiwan to China and back again. Um, and they have always said adamantly there's a one China policy and that... Um, but that doesn't mean they want to be taken over. And, and the Belt and Road is, a, is obviously a, 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 a um, you know, it's a thing countries would like, you know, it's, it's an attractive thing. But uh, that doesn't mean they're going to be a military. And I think that Australians have got to uh, not just even when, uh, but again, then you've got another factor. And I remember when Pacific Islanders used to do this with the Libyans. The Tongans used to use the Libyans to threaten the Australians and say, oh, we're going to get the Libyans to build us an airport if you don't build one. <laughs> you know? So, you, you know, there's all there's, there's this game playing by the small island states. As, and And... Timor usually doesn't do much of that, but I noticed that Ramos Horta did it once and then Penny Wong reprimanded him. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so I think he knows where he stands now. And, and again, but but he's only the president. He is not the government. And, and I think that there must be a huge debate going on now. One of the things that worries me a little bit, I think, is that the that, that parties that previously opposed the pipeline under the sea now seem to be standing up for it as if it's become an issue of Timorese identity and respect rather than a real scientific proposition. And this is a bit worrying. Um, and I, I personally don't think that anyone in China will want to invest in it, so I don't think there's that there's that worry, but I don't really have a lot more. And, and I think 
And the other thing is, and the current government is doing this now, trying to build a new development plan with the emphasis on non-oil revenues, with the building the non-oil economy. This is this is Rui, Rui Gomez's approach, has been ever since in 2011 when he wrote a human development report on it, which was banned by Shanana. Well, Shanana didn't want a non-oil economy, he wanted an oil economy. So there is an internal debate in Timor, uh, and I think that's about all I'll say, I think. Thanks, Helen, and that's been really um, a fascinating talk um, uh, that you've given us. And I'm wondering, um, would, could you tell us what, what you think Australia might be able to contribute in the right way of education um, to assist the development of, um, of team? What, what would they like us to do um, in relation to education? Right. Now, my view on education is that Timor hasn't really had the education for what debate that Pacific Islands had when they came to independence. Everybody's got a different idea of what education is for. And it depends on your class background and your ethnic background and a few other things. So there is a huge confusion. One thing, a comment I will make, and I could have made a slide about this, Australians and New Zealanders wrote the qualifications framework and it is very Anglo-Saxon, I'm sorry to say. Even uses words like vocational, you know, which in Timor means going to be a priest or a nun. And, um, you know, and words like trades, which in Timor means export-import. So <laughs> you, you've got a discourse which is confused a lot of people believe that, as with a lot of developing countries, oh, what they need is vocation, technical vocational education. In reality, technical vocational education has been put too low. In the, it's in the secondary school. It should be post-secondary. Now, we have been having some discussions recently at Victoria University. Uh, we have a... a an MOU with National University of Timor RSI and Victoria University is a dual sector university. It has TAFE as well as secondary education. And a lot of people are now getting interested in this in Timor, that basic skills in accounting and fisheries and various other areas are needed, which are not actually taught anywhere. Dressmaking, hairdressing, not taught, uh, which are needed in the system somewhere, which could be taught at a TAFE, or I'd prefer to use the word community college sector of a university. And then you can articulate. They would also then learn about recognition of prior learning, articulation to higher levels, and careers education. Careers education is non existent and utterly needed. Um, Roberto here was my colleague in the Ministry of Education. He rewrote the secondary school IT uh, uh, curriculum, year 10, 11 and 12. Secondary school is 10, 11 and 12. There's a huge push on at the moment for preschool and I believe Australia is going to put stump. New Zealand has been focusing on preschool for years. New Zealand is the one English speaking country in donor country that has a good policy in education, I think. Australia barely touches education. Um, they never supported National University of Timor RSI. The only thing they supported there was a agricultural curriculum based on industrial agriculture, you know, on chemicals and pesticides and stuff like this. And it's very sad because Australia is the home to two innovations, I guess you'd call them, that could be so valuable in small island states, namely permaculture and land care. And they've never been part of the aid program. Now, ask yourself why. <laughs> I don't know. Some of you might know better than me. 
The only place permaculture was in the aid program was in Cuba because the Cubans asked for it. They knew about it and asked for it. No other government has. So um, this is why it's interesting what Ego Lemos is doing and um, the, the way in which ideas are getting around. And I think, anyway, I'd better stop there and see if anyone else wants to ask a, a question. I think any, that anyone from the Zoom got any questions? Yeah, we, we've got a couple of quick ones. If we can make it real quick, we're sort of running out of time. What I'd suggest is we'll, we'll answer too quickly from Zoom mm -hmm. and then, then we'll wrap up because we're sort of reaching out and then please just stick around and come and have a chat. To, so mm -hmm. if we can just jump in quickly on Zoom too. And I think you sort of answered. One is um, what's the role that Australian civil society can still play in Timor-Leste, and, and the others is um, what are the environmental and sustainable development issues confronting the country? Right, so yes, well, quickly answer look, so uh, yes, and, and I, we'll... I should have talked about this because I had planned to make more of a mention of some of the friendship cities. There is some very good work going on uh, with the friendship cities, and as I've been doing a job recently on municipal planning, it shocks me what lack of connect, connection there is. There are lots of areas in which people need to join the dots, bring together people who know about permaculture, people who know about um, uh, women's advocacy, people who know about adding value to primary products, which is how you're going to build the economy, and uh, I think that many of them could expand their activity, uh, you know, just by, you know, talking to more people. Uh, and, and that is, I think, a very important, uh, the, uh, from the advocacy, uh, also importing Timorese goods, you know, coffee, uh, uh, coconut oil. Salt, yes, there is, yes, there are various commodities that could be imported in a small scale uh, through fair trade. Well, look, Helen, thank you so much for coming. Uh, oh, sorry, so what here. was another question? Well, well, I think we've sort of reached our, our oh, time yeah. limit, so we're good. So look, what we'll do is we'll wrap up the Zoom. Thank you to the Zoom audience for your interest and your questions. Um, live audience here, please stick around and still just have a chat to... Uh,